Is there a place for, you know, robots stacking shelves in supermarkets and other retail businesses? Absolutely. Should people be stacking shelves in supermarkets? Personally, I don't think so. Mm -hmm. You know, because what you're doing is, and, and I find this when I do my mystery shopping, you go in, you want to, you, you don't even know whether you can talk to someone or not. Mm -hmm. They've got a high-vis jacket on. Is that someone that's approachable? Mm -hmm. Are they a, like a customer-facing member of staff? Or are they only doing shelf stacking? Mm -hmm. You know, I just think we've completely forgotten what it's like to serve people, right? And again, mm -hmm. when I talk to consumers and I say to them, what frustrates you about the in-store shopping experience? One, there's never enough staff to serve, or two, you don't know who's meant to be serving you in the first place. Mm -hmm. Hello, and welcome to Anatomy of a Leader show with me, Maria Vorostovsky. I'm the founder and CEO of HVO Search. Founders, CEOs, and lone HR directors hire me when they feel stuck and under pressure to hire the right senior leaders who will grow their companies. They work with me to ensure they don't hire the wrong person. I'm on a mission to discover what makes a great leader, the skills they have, what drives them, to really dissect what success looks like and what it takes to get to the very top. My aim is to bring to you leadership stories of entrepreneurs, founders, CEOs, investors, authors, leaders from all walks of life, the failures they faced, what they wish they knew before they started and the hurdles they had to overcome. If you want to be inspired, surprised and feel like you're not alone in your struggles towards the very top you're in the right place here on anatomy of a leader like and comment below and subscribe to make sure you don't miss a single episode it will change the way you think and may even change your life Martin, hello. Welcome to the show. Nice Hi. to nice to see you face to face. Indeed, it's been a while, Maria. It's been a while. It has been a Thanks while. Thanks for having me on. Yes. Well, Martin, you are a keynote speaker, author. You talk a lot about customer centricity. I talk a lot. You talk a lot. I talk a lot about customer centricity as well. You founded Practicology. <laughs> I did, yeah. A little while back. And um, well, let's go to the beginning. Tell, sure. you know, for those people who don't know you, yeah. can you give us a bit of a, a background? Hopefully, hopefully I don't put them to sleep. Well, be brief. <laughs> I'll, be, I'll be relatively brief. I, I, start, I started my career on the shop floor of my father's retail optical practices in Glasgow. So he had a small chain of opticians um, just when optics was being deregulated. So most people don't know actually that there was a point in time in way back in the sort of early 1980s and prior to that where optics was a very heavily kind of government regulated industry mm. you couldn't advertise you know there were no spec savers or vision expresses or anything and my dad had obviously hoped when things were opening up that I would go to university do a BSc in optics come in build the build them spec savers you know but um, sadly that wasn't to be I think I was still trying to find myself at that age but you know, what it did do is it definitely gave me a, a taste for great customer service and customer experience because my dad was just super focused on that. And so I used to watch him, you know, he'd test a patient's eyes, come out, mm -hmm. and he was just, he was a past master at, you know, selling them two pairs, you know, two pairs of glasses and a, and a pair of sunglasses, even when they'd only <laughs> probably come in for, you know, just to make sure their eyes were okay. Um, so he was very good at that. And he was also great at continually updating the, the practices and investing in it. And I remember saying to him, you know, why are you spending so much money, mm -hmm. you know, continually doing this every couple of years? And he said, well, if I don't do it, you know, somebody else will. So that was my, I say, I'd say that was my kind of foray into customer experience that really gave me a, a taste for it. And when I think through really back or over my whole career, you know, it's always been a focal point for me. What's interesting is, you know, I came down, you know, I came down to London uh, 17 years ago now to head up home shopping at Harrods and I had a role at Harrods and I was at Burberry, Pentland, then Burberry, then Ted Baker. And, and everyone thought I was an e-commerce expert and there's probably still some people that consider me to be so. I don't, I've never thought of myself as that. I've always mm. thought, as my, thought of myself as somebody who really understands consumers and consumer behavior and customer behavior, both in a, I think in a consumer sense and a business sense. And that I think is my thing. And, and that's what I've launched onto and, you know, try to learn as much as I can. I've tried to be, I guess, a beacon for that to some extent to help 
businesses understand what it means to be truly customer centric and what those building blocks are and you know how you go on that journey but obviously being in some of those big brands was very helpful because some of you know like of Burberry and you know Pentland and Harrods as well of course and Ted Baker were all pretty focused on different aspects of customer experience mm. so it gave me an opportunity to I guess expand my knowledge and live and breathe it as well while I was doing it but I first got involved I should maybe turn the clock back a second because it's relevant to kind of how I've ended up where I am today. Um, I first got involved in the internet way back in 97 and I'd never even used a computer. So I was sitting at my desk in the Hillington Industri Industrial Estate in Glasgow. I was a marketing director for a company called Sports Connection, who at the time were, I think, the fifth largest sports retailer in the UK. We had about 40 odd stores, mainly in the north of England and Scotland. And I had a PA called Louise and I was chasing a document one day that she'd been typing. And I said, Louise, where's such and such? And she was on the web. And I said, I've heard about this web thing. Can you show <laughs> me it? This? <laughs> yeah, show me it. And while you're at it, can you show me how to switch this big box that's been sitting, <laughs> taking up half my desk for the last year called a computer on and show me how to send an email and just become a bit sort of more self-efficient, I guess. Um, and that was, it was a wake up moment for me because, I mean, I was a bit of a Luddite on the technology and my instinct was, this was the way I needed to throw myself into it. But my my instinct was the web was the way everything was going. And within a very short time of that, I had launched a website in the sports trade. I had a transactional e-commerce site, which was generating absolutely nothing. <laughs> I told my boss, you know, we're going to sell millions of pounds worth of new, you know, new, generate new millions of pounds worth of demand, hundreds of new, thousands of new customers. But of course, this is back in the, the days of dial-up modem when it took 20 minutes for a product <laughs> page to download. Yeah. So it was such a crap experience. Nobody bought anything. Um, and then I went on to actually build a, a small web design, web development business. Because I kind of figured, well, if I need a website for Sports Connection, everyone's going to need a website. And there weren't many companies around that were building them at the time. So I started doing domain registration, hosting, then brochureware websites, then ultimately e-commerce. Um, <clears throat> a bit of digital marketing just at the time when a little company called Google was starting. Mm. Um, and anyway, cut long story short, after a couple of years of doing really, really well, I had a flashy Mercedes with a registration plate, W66 for web, WWW for World Wide Web. Got a wee bit ahead of myself. Um, the business, unfortunately, I had to pull the plug in the business because I was part of the dot bomb. I was in the dot com when it was going up and I was in the dot bomb when it, when it fell out because what we were doing is we were building websites and we'd say to a client, there you go, that'll be £100,000, thank you. And when we banked that, seemed really good but then of course as soon as the opportunities dried up in sort of 2000 2001 we had no recurring revenue you know the software as a service didn't really exist but if you fast forward to practicology which you mentioned earlier um which is a consulting business which I started in 2009 and grew to 100 people in dubai hong kong guangzhou in china sydney and melbourne and australia um which we sold in 2018 you know that business would never have survived and I would never have been able to, you know, make it sustainable over that length of period of time had I not made the mistakes that I made before because I wouldn't have been close enough to the cash flow. I wouldn't have been close enough to, you know, the people, the hiring curve, making sure I didn't get ahead of myself again. Um so I think I did all the I think I did all the right things second time round, but it probably took a, a business failure to set me up for that success, you know. Mm. And Talking about kind of your, you know, going back to what you were saying earlier about working with your father, was that your first kind of job? Was that the yeah. first time? Right. Yeah, absolutely was. And how was that for you? I mean, what, what? <laughs> it was tough. I mean, obviously working with your parents <clears throat> is always a tricky one, you know, partly, you know, either you really follow in those footsteps because you kind of get all of yeah. the, the tricks of the trade or you want to go completely the opposite yeah. i mean what was your experience then what did well you i I, lo I love that? them and miss them dearly because they're, they're both long gone unfortunately from this mortal coil but um i i probably wasn't i didn't know what i was doing at that age you know i was a bit of a loose cannon a bit bit of a wild boy and mm -hmm. you know really was still trying to find myself and you know i don't think i particularly enjoyed living with them i don't think they particularly enjoyed having me <laughs> uh, at various moments in time and therefore working with my dad as much as it was a great opportunity to kind of 
of learn mm -hmm. a craft and get into something like customer experience, customer service and marketing, you know, it was tough because, yeah, I suppose I, I suppose I, on one hand, it was great because I could learn, I could, it's new, it, I guess it's an old version of test and learn, you know, because I could do things and make mistakes and not mm. lose my job, mm. which is one of the benefits of working for a family business. But then on the other hand, you know, I kind of always felt that, well, my dad gave me the job and I didn't really earn it. And so, uh, you know, I maybe had a wee chip in my shoulder and thought I'm going to have to go and prove myself elsewhere at some mm. point in time, you know, but it was a good, it was a good learning curve for sure. And, you know, I certainly, I, I can understand why people often don't do what I did and go into family businesses and end up becoming the next generation and take the business on to the next level and have a fantastic career and, you know, doing it. Mm. And talking about customer centricity, I mean, what what did you take away from that? I mean, you talked about, you know, your your, your father kind of paying attention and saying, well, if, if I don't do this, somebody else would. Yeah. I mean, what, what did you learn about customer what customers want at that point? Well, he was just, he was always great at making sure people came back, mm. you know, and I get so frustrated with the focus today, you know, what I mean, with the advent of digital marketing and performance marketing, basically, I personally think that we've focused so much on that because we can measure the ROI, because we can measure ROAS, return on advertising spend, that we've forgotten what it's like to do the other stuff, to build relationships, to drive customer retention, to build customer lifetime value. I really do, because you don't see a lot of that going on. You know, and the majority of consumer facing businesses mm -hmm. aren't, aren't, aren't really good at that because they're all focused on the top of the funnel and bringing people in the door. And my dad was just great at always making sure people came back. And that was partly driven by the great service that he did. He was a bloody good optician. He always, you know, so he he did his job professionally extremely well. He also made sure he made people look good and feel good about themselves, mm -hmm. right? And again, this was at a time where, you know, optics was just opening up and commercial, you know, more commercial, better looking frames were coming in. You didn't just have to have a, a pair of NHS glasses, right? Mm -hmm. Which didn't look that brilliant at the time. I'm sure they've improved since. Um, and so, you know, he made people feel good. He made them look good. He made them see better. Um, but he also made sure they came back. And, you know, I was doing some very, very rudimentary, basic CRM for him. I was literally going through the, you know, the, we, we literally had a roller deck of patients and I would go through it every week and I would phone people up and say, it's time to get your eyes tested again. You know, I didn't have a computer to use. I didn't have a spreadsheet or some kind of early warning system that told me it was now time to mm -hmm. contact Maria and get her back in for an eye <laughs> test. I was literally going through a roller deck doing this. Mm -hmm. So it really was very basic, but it, but it was, you know, classic direct marketing mm -hmm. um, that I was cutting my teeth on. So I just think he was, he had an instinct for all of that. And I think I inherited that from mm -hmm. him, you know. So talking about customer centricity, mm. Obviously, there's so many different definitions of that. Oh, there are. So what is that to you? And how do you define it? Well, the first thing I'm going to say is it's a little bit like any of the industry buzzwords, sometimes known as BS bingo. <laughs> I don't think it necessarily is BS bingo, but, you know, we, we get hooked on these terms like omnichannel or digital transformation or customer centricity, which is really my thing. And... I think what's frustrating about it is if you ask 100 people in 100 different businesses what each of those terms and phrases mean, you will get 10,000 different answers. Mm -hmm. Nobody will answer it exactly the same. And therefore, how does that then become a framework that anyone, like, you know, because what you want to make sure, obviously, is when you, as a business, you have a strategy, you want to make sure that everyone's pointing in the same direction. But if you're using terminology that actually means different things to different people, then it's quite hard to do that in a practical sense. So I set about trying to define what I thought customer centricity actually is um, about essentially 2017. I've been talking about it for a long, long time. And interestingly, I was doing a, I was doing a presentation earlier today and I found a slide, I came up on my, on my Facebook memories and I was doing a presentation back in 2014 at the London School of Economics. And I actually, I went on after Laura Wade Geary. She did a keynote, I did a keynote. She was at Tesco at the time. I think his multi-channel director, or it could have been MS, I'm not sure, but anyway, and my my title was about it was about using customer centricity to drive sales and profitability, which is the tagline of my latest book. I hadn't even realised that right when I was trying to come up with a title for the book and a, and a, and a tagline for it. 
But I've been talking about it for a long, long time and a lot longer than that. And so I set about when I wrote my first book in 2017, which came out in 2018, I was trying to, that was my effort of trying to define what is it? What are the building blocks? For me, at a practical level, if I bring if I bring some of it to life, for me, actually the starting point is being a people first business. It's not even about customers. I always start with the in, the internal lens, because if you're not a people first business and you don't have a good culture, and you don't train people and develop them and give them career progression opportunities and show them that there's a a pathway for them in the business, and you do the opposite and you rip up their contracts and try and rehire them on mm -hmm. poorer commercial terms as some businesses do these days, and don't train them and don't develop them, well, they don't hang around very often. And if they don't hang around very often, and, and even if they do, you tend to find that all they're trying to do is survive. They're not really engaged. And if they're not engaged and they're not motivated, they're not going to deliver the type of experience that customers want and they're not going to do the best for the business either. So I do think there's a very strong cause and effect with all of that. And so for me, that's my starting point. I'm looking at making sure there's an environment that's fit for purpose mm. where people can really thrive. Mm -hmm. And they will, and you, know, you spring out of bed because you're excited to go to work, not because you're just trying to survive from mm -hmm. one week or one month to the next. Well, you don't retain the best people if you don't have a good culture. Culture. And I love the fact that exactly. you're saying that. I, I would take it even <clears throat> one step further. And I would say that actually it's also taking care of yourself first. And because if you understand what your needs are, you understand what the needs are of the people within yeah. the business and then the wider world as a whole. Sure. And I think this idea of, I mean, just self-awareness. Self-awareness, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I would I would agree with that. I think that's a good that's a great observation. But as I say, normally I'm just looking at it at a business level. I'm thinking, right, you know, what does it look like internally? And if we've got that right, and just using some practical examples, right, you, you may have seen at some point in time, I'm sure, Timson, you know, the, the cobblers and the key cutting business is the upside down management model, which has management on the bottom. So the pyramid is upside down mm -hmm. rather than the the small part of the pyramid at the top. It's in the bottom and that's where the management sit. Mm -hmm. Then you've got, it, all employees, then you've got employees that face into customers, then you've got customers. Mm -hmm. And in most strategy decks and most board presentations, it would be the other way around. You know, management and board and the executive team would see themselves at the top of that pyramid. Mm -hmm. and the problem with that is it doesn't it doesn't create the culture or the environment that, that's required. And, you know, part of being a people first business is empowering people, empowering them to do the job to the best of their ability, mm -hmm. giving them a freedom to do things, giving them a freedom to come up with ideas, mm -hmm. the freedom to make mistakes mm -hmm. and not be penalized for it. You know, most businesses I've worked for in my career would be the opposite. You were so scared about making a mistake and what the implications might be on your tenure, you know, in that in that role. You just wouldn't step outside of your comfort zone. You wouldn't do anything that you thought might risk that. And I think that's such a shame. I think it's this industrial age thinking where you have to follow rules and guidelines yeah. rather than actually to think creatively and innovate. And I think this is in our in our age now, that's more prized because you know, we've, we're, we're moving at such a pace that actually coming up with new ideas and new ways of doing things is more important than following. 100%, 100%. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I I mean, for me, the most powerful thing is if you if you can empower people on the front line, people who end up, we're talking about retail, people who are, or hospitality, mm -hmm. or any consumer sector, cars, whatever, people who are facing into customers, consumers. And it, I, the same applies in the business environment as well. If you can empower them, give them the right tools and give them that bit of freedom, they, they just thrive, they fly. You know, Home Depot, right? Biggest DIY, one of the biggest DIY retailers in North America, similar to our B&Q here. They actually, um, there's a few things they do really well. Um, they empower their colleagues in the store to give a $50 discount, up to $50 discount to customers, mm. right? Why? because it helps them to close the deal. And a lot of the sales in there are quite high average order values because of the products they're selling. I've done some mystery shopping recently and gone around all the DIY retailers in the UK, and I'm telling you, nobody tried to sell me a damn thing, mm. right? Because they're not focused on it. They really aren't. I mean, literally, I was trying to buy, I was trying to buy a ring doorbell or one of those video camera type doorbells. Nobody was taking me to the aisle, showing me the product, showing me the difference between one and another, and ultimately trying to sell me something. Mm. We've lost the art of selling in retail, but that's not necessarily the fault of the people that are on the front line. It's the fault of the people that are giving them the direction mm -hmm. or 
not incentivizing them accordingly in the first place and giving them that opportunity. Uh, Home Depot, they they look after their colleagues in times of financial emergency. They help their they help their friends, their you know, and their family out. They encourage everyone in the business to undertake further education, mm-hmm. right? And they pay for it, right? Why? Because they know that they're going to get back better skills, better skilled people who will stay in the business for longer. Mm. It's just common sense. Do you think it's you know retailers have just been sitting on their laurels and just expecting customer, you know, just like, okay, we've opened the doors, we've got the product in, it's here, come in, and people will just buy it. It's not so simple what, what I think, anymore. What I think the cause and effect is with that, Maria, is that I think that, the, and obviously not all retailers fall into this category because there are many that are great, great businesses. But I think with some, they're a little bit, the, 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 they're a little bit stuck in what it was like pre-1994. So 1994 was the first online transaction. And the web was invented, the World Wide Web was invented by Sir Tim Berners-Lee. I've had the privilege of sharing a stage with him once. But, you know, prior to that, as consumers, we had limited choice. Mm-hmm. You know, we had our local high street. We had shopping malls. We had maybe a catalogue. Some brands had catalogues and maybe the odd retail park. And that was it. We didn't have a lot of choice as consumers. Of course, the web gradually over a period of time changed that, turned it on its head because, and it began the democratization of retail, as I would call it, because now we have the power as consumers. Because if we don't find what we're looking for with one brand or we have a poor experience, we've got 100,000 options online. So is it to do with choice? Is it to do with having so many options? I think that, well, I think the choice is a, I think the choice is a huge driver. It's a, it's a huge driver, but it's actually about consumer empowerment, right? So when I talk to boards, often when I ask them the question of what's keeping them up at night, very often a CEO or a CFO or a CEO will say to me, the cost to serve, oh, it's just, it's killing margin. And I know when I hear that, I know that they're going to make all the wrong decisions mm-hmm. because what they're going to do is they're going to strip, they're going to look to strip cost out of the business. They're going to look to take heads out of the store. They're going to look to not make the investment in technology they need to make, either to empower customers or empower their employees because they're looking at the cost to serve. And the problem is it drives all the wrong outcomes for the consumer. So guess what? The consumer then goes, well, you don't do click and collect. You don't do curbside pickup. You don't, you know, have next day delivery or same day delivery, I'm going to go and find somebody else who does. Simple as that. And that is what happens, right? So you can either take a view of, well, you can't do everything, mm-hmm. or you can take a view that, well, let's get the fu- let's get the fundamentals right. Let's understand what it is that drives consumers and that they're looking for as at least a base level of experience and then build out from there. You know, that's the starting point. And I think that there's a lot of people still don't really grasp what that transition of power from brand and retailer to consumer has actually meant. Mm. You know, the ones that do are the disruptors. So if you look at Monzo Bank or you look at Uber or you look at Deliveroo or you look at Rockar, Rockar is a technology who now enable the car brands to go direct to consumer. Why do they want to go direct to consumer? Because the traditional car buying experience of going to a big shed out of town somewhere isn't great. Mm. Usually it's a bit uncomfortable from a sales point of view. Um, it can be quite misogynistic at times as well, I would I would imagine. Um, there's a lot of things about it that haven't been great over the years. And so the car brands want to own the relationship with the customer. And so Rockar provide the technology to enable them to do that both online and in a physical environment. And where are those car brands that really get this? Opening their showrooms. They're not opening them in big sheds 10 miles out of town. They're opening them in Westfield and shopping centres and Brent Cross, Tesla and Brent Cross. I remember when Tesla first opened in Brent Cross, I thought, what the heck's that all about? <laughs> and I genuinely thought it was a bit gimmicky, you know, initially. And then I realised they're democratising the experience and they're taking their product to where customers are, just like a retail business does. Mm. So I think that a lot of things have changed, but unfortunately... I think there's a lot of a lot of brands that either aren't here anymore or are toiling a bit because they haven't caught up because mm. they've maybe not grasped what that means for their business. Because if they did, they would see customers as a benefit, as a lifetime value, and certainly not as a cost center. So what should retailers that are sort of hanging on by a, a <laughs> by a hair or whatever the expression is, like what must they be doing? What must they be thinking and how should they act now? 
You know, I think the first thing is, I mean, you've obviously got to have products that people want to buy, right? So let's take that as a given, right? If you don't have products that people don't want to buy, then, you know, it's like sayonara, you're in trouble, right? But as long as you've got something that people, that consumers generally want to buy, I think a lot of it comes down to what you stand for. A lot of it comes down to your purpose, your values, being authentic, being transparent, Right. You know, as I think, as you know, I pop up every now and again, my ugly mug on the one show or Sky or whatever as a talking head talking about things that are going on in industry. And a few weeks ago, I was on the one show and I was asked to talk about Moss Bros. And I have nothing against Moss Bros. Right. And I feel deeply, genuinely for all retailers and every consumer business and what they've been through in the last couple of years. Right. It's an absolute nightmare. I don't know how I would have coped if I was still, I had a hard enough time doing what I do. I don't know how I would have coped if I was still on the retail side. So they've done a remarkable job coming through that. But it was pretty obvious that people who had cancelled their weddings, right, were going to want to all get hitched probably mm -hmm. as soon as everything opened up again and they could they could invite as many people as they wanted and they could book the right venue and, and everything else. And I just don't think they were prepared for that. Mm -hmm. But that is, to some extent, forgivable, I think, but not the way they handled it and not the way they dealt with it. And they were telling, they were misleading a lot of people and really ruining their big day because they were saying, oh, no, don't worry, your suits will be here. Come in two days before and lo and behold, the suits weren't there or only half the suits were there or they had the wrong sizes or they just didn't have any. Mm. And that obviously let down and upset an awful lot of people at what is one of the biggest days in your life. And at the time, I looked on the website and there was a message that said, we've been overly kind of inundated recently with contacts to our customer service team. No shit, Charlotte, <laughs> right? Yeah. Uh, and mm -hmm. for obvious reasons. Mm -hmm. uh, and if you have already contacted us by email, please don't do so again, as all that's going to do is slow down the process. We apologize for any inconvenience. I mean, that was just awful. Mm -hmm. Now, if I'd been running that business, sorry, but I would have been out front at a stuck a video on the homepage of the website and I would have been apologising. I would have said, I'm really sorry. We haven't got this right. We're letting people down. I want you to know we're doing something about it. This is what we're doing about it. Please, you know, understand that mm. all of a sudden we're dealing with 10 times the volume mm -hmm. of wedding requests for suits than we had, than we've ever had in the past. And we're trying our very best to deal with it. Mm -hmm. And I think if they'd done that, I think they would have got a lot more people who would have been accepting of it. And it's like in a marriage, right? When you're having an argument and, you know, one partner really wants to say something and the other one's just basically sticking their ears and, you know, fingers Finger in their ears, ears and yeah. saying, I can't hear you. And yeah. the more they do that, the less they <clears throat> communicate, the more you're frustrated that you get. Yeah. And it's the same situation here. It's like you can't under communicate. Well, I'm delighted to say I don't have a lot of experience with that. <laughs> My wife and I communicate quite well. But say, I suppose we have our odd moments like everybody else. But mm. no, you're, you're absolutely right. But I I just, I think it's, you know, authenticity and transparency, I think are so important. And mm -hmm. I really believe that if you do that, and that's all you do, people will give you, there's a, you will generate some goodwill. It's when you hide behind things and you don't do that. And as you know, I do, I'm heavily involved in things like customer service. You know, I, I'm not going to name any names, but I talk to businesses every day who say, you know, all they want to do is make that go away. It's a problem, mm -hmm. right? I don't look at it as a problem. I think it's a fantastic opportunity. Mm -hmm. Somebody's contacted you in your contact center because there's an issue. Great. Let's resolve the issue. And then let's work out how we make sure that person comes back mm -hmm. and we build their loyalty and we build their lifetime value. And we're doing the opposite of that. So what do we expect? Mm. It's like when you already open that line of communication, you know, if someone really genuinely didn't care and they could go elsewhere, they wouldn't even bother writing, right? So here's an opportunity to get connect with your customer who, if you treat them well, will be with you forever. Not only that, but they become advocates. And it's, you know, it is incredible. You know, I've got stats from the, the ombudsman that tell me in a couple of years ago, mm -hmm. there were 173 million complaints in the UK. Only 48 million of them actually made it to the brand. Mm. So what happened to the other 120 odd million? Do the maths. You know, where did it, where did they end up? They end up on social media or they end up being discussed with their colleagues at work around the water cooler or with their friends and family around the dinner table. 
that's a disaster. Why would it? Why would any brand be happy with that? Mm. Why wouldn't you want them coming to you so that you can do something about it? So why don't brands recognise that? Why do they not see well, that as so, important? I think some do. I think mm. some do. I mean, some do, some don't. Mm. You know, I, I tell the story and it's a true story. You know, I was privileged to be on the advisory board of Wiggle, you know, going back. Um, I should at some point talk about what I'm doing today, actually, as well. <laughs> you must remind me. Um, but I was on the advisory board of Wiggle, you know, the fantastic online bike retailer and at the time the, the, the then CEO shall remain nameless who is a who's a great guy running a very successful different but very successful business today he was doing a presentation and you know they were very open about numbers and at that time the business had a very large lapsed customer base I'm talking about close to a million and I was gobsmacked and I was like that's really weird what's going on and at the same time a friend of mine who was a big Wiggle customer, said to me, I've got to send, when he found out I was getting involved, he said, I've got to send you this email string. So he sent me an email and basically he had been trying to buy some parts for a bike. He was going into a competition. They'd sent him their own parts. He was getting really frustrated. He's going backwards and forwards with customer service. And he's just said, look, I've got this thing, this competition coming up. I need this urgently. Please call me to arrange a convenient time to, to deliver the right parts. An email that came back said, Dear Mr. Hamilton, I'm really sorry, but at the moment we only talk to customers through live chat and email. Can you believe that? <laughs> In other words, just like sticking your fingers up. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to phone you, mm -hmm. right? So I said to the CEO, I said, why on earth would we do that? Mm -hmm. Have you not looked, looked at putting a contact center in? He said, you're kidding me. Do you know how many email contacts we have a day? He said, that would cost us a fortune. I said, ah, so you've looked at the cost, but you haven't looked at the benefit. Mm -hmm. And it comes back to what I'm saying about the focus on customers as a cost center drives all their own decisions. Mm -hmm. When I know, and I know from experience, you put a contact center in even today and give people the opportunity to talk to somebody. It's a selling opportunity. Mm -hmm. It's not just an opportunity to serve and resolve an issue. It's potentially a selling opportunity or it can be. Mm -hmm. So it really, I find it, I do find it really frustrating. You know, I think because for me, it feels quite obvious and common sense, but some people see it differently. And But really what that was about, as I said, he was a very smart guy and did a great job building the business and built it to a level I couldn't have done. But I think the big mistake was he saw it as a pure play internet business that could use technology to replace human intervention. And I don't think that is the right approach. I don't think it was the right approach then. And I don't think it's the right approach today. Have you engaged with a chatbot online? I have. I actually worked on creating a chatbot oh, really? and I've tested quite a few. I mean, this was a while ago and I haven't really, they haven't really moved on. There was kind Absolutely of like a... Absolutely does my nut in mm -hmm. big time. Mm -hmm. Does my nut in. Mm -hmm. It's fine. You know, if you're, I don't know, let's say you're British Airways and you've got a hundred thousand people all contacting you at the same time, like where's my refund, right? Mm -hmm. Cause I'm not allowed to fly. Then you can use a chatbot <clears throat> to funnel someone to the right person, the team that can deal with that. But if you're coming back from Portugal and you want to come back three days early and you're trying to change your flight, a chatbot is completely useless and is not going to help you with any of that, right? No. And, and I, I honestly, my my only experiences as a consumer of engaging with a chatbot have been exclusively bad. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I, I think artificial intelligence has a role to play and I think it will get better over time. But honestly, I would never replace or look to replace human intervention entirely. And what I, you know, there's been a lot of talk about robots. You know, you'll go into retail in a few years' time and it will be a robot that will serve you. No, it won't. I think there a is human a, being. I, I, I think there is definitely a place for that. I mean, this is a, probably a conversation for another day, but sure. I do see the use of artificial intelligence and some kind of, you know, automated ways of doing things. Sure. But you have to understand it from the person of the, you know, from the perspective of the customer. Correct. What are they actually Correct. asking for? Because, <laughs> you know, sometimes when you're co contacting customer service, you might not even know what eventually you want. Otherwise you say, I want a refund for yeah. X. You know, you're not, as a human being, you're not that used to just coming up with the sure. solution yourself. So you're probably looking for a solution uh, rather than yes or no kind of answers. You're 100% you're right. But that, but that is about understanding. So with technology, the problem that most businesses make when they make investment decisions about technology is often it ends up being technology for technology's sake. Sometimes it's follow the leader, but very rarely is it because actually we've got some serious problems here we need yeah. to solve for. 
customer facing problems, right? And and taking that insight and using that to help make better informed decisions about, you know, the solutions and the information architecture and the type of ecosystem that you're going to create that's not only going to be fit for purpose in the short term, but will mm-hmm more than likely be fit for purpose in the long term, albeit we don't know exactly what's coming down the pipe. I agree. You know, I, I'm not absolutely not saying there's not a role for AI. But from my perspective, AI is there to do the heavy lifting. You know, for example, if you're running an e-commerce site today and you're in a competitive sector, as most businesses are, how are you going to work out when to discount products? Are you making that decision yourself internally? Are you looking at what the competitive set are doing? And, and if so, how are you doing that? Are you scraping their site? Are you doing it manually as a lot of businesses are doing? Or actually using AI to tell you, not not at a category level, but at a SKU level, when that SKU should be discounted. Because this is what's going on in the industry right now with your competitors. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Is there a place for that? Every day of the week. Is there a place for, sorry, is there a place for, you know, robots stacking shelves in supermarkets and other retail businesses? Absolutely. Should people be stacking shelves in supermarkets? Personally, I don't think so. Mm-hmm. You know, because what you're doing is, and, and I find this when I do my mystery shopping, you go in, you want to, you, you don't even know whether you can talk to someone or not. Mm-hmm. They've got a high-vis jacket on. Is that someone that's approachable? Mm-hmm. Are they a, like a customer-facing member of staff? Or are they only doing shelf stacking? Mm-hmm. You know, I just think we've completely forgotten what it's like <laughs> to serve people, right? And again, mm-hmm. when I talk to consumers and I say to them, what frustrates you about the in-store shopping experience? One, there's never enough staff to serve. Or two, you don't know who's meant to be serving you in the first place. Mm-hmm. You know? So what is it that we're missing from customer service? I mean, obviously, it seems like sometimes when you go into a store, it's almost like you're you're a nuisance and you know, you're there just to simply pick up a product, take it to the till and pay for it. Well, actually, that's not really what we're looking for, especially the fact that we haven't been shopping in physical yeah. environments as a result of something called COVID yeah. and have been used to, you know, if we want convenience, we can go online. We can exactly find the exact thing that we want and probably have it delivered. Mm. So why go into a store now? Well, I think you're going to, <clears throat> you'll go into a physical environment for uh, an experience mm-hmm. that you won't get online. So we're not at the metaverse yet, which I'm sure we'll talk about later. Mm-hmm. That's coming. So online at the moment, yes, it's convenient, but it's still quite a flat experience. You might have a bit of video. There's not a lot of interaction. It's 2D. It's not 3D, right? So I think if you want an experience, and bearing in mind that we've all been starved of the ability to go out and about. So I don't, I think for the foreseeable future, you know, physical retail is not going anywhere. There's a big part for physical retail to play. And the reality is, as of today, according to the the Office of National Statistics, not an easy word for me to say, Office (laughs) of National Statistics, Mm -hmm. roughly 28% of sales are online Mm -hmm. and 72% of sales are offline. So, you know, but that's across all categories. And obviously there are some where where the online sales are much higher. Why does click and collect work? Why do people even bother with that, right? They bother with that in my mind because you're thinking about the product you're buying. If it's not quite right, if you click and collect it, you can change your mind there and then. It might be about size, it might be about color, it might be about exchanging it, you know, for something else. You're also kind of still worried about what if I'm what if I'm not in when it's delivered? What is the process involved around that? What if I have to return it? What's the process around that? And is there a cost associated with it? So, you know, there are a whole bunch of drivers that drive consumers to, you know, opt for something like click and collect, but that brings people into store mm. as well. Um, but I think it's an opportunity for a brand owner to actually bring the brand to life, tell the story, you know. And I, and I, I have to say that, you know, I've probably beaten them up in the past, but I don't know if you've been into the Sports Direct store. Not for a while. In no. Oxford Street. Mm-hmm. But they've they're they're very much elevating all their retail, you know, their retail brands. I mean, obviously they own flannels and you know they put an incredible investment into creating, you know, a really engaging, quite immersive experience in there. And they've now done that in the Sports Direct store. And it really feels like a very different proposition mm. to what it used to be, kind of stack at high, sell them cheap. And that's elevating the brand. And it's a, and I, what think did it's they a do really, differently? I think it's a really good move. Well, I think they, they you know, there's 
less product, so you can actually see the product. You know, they use technology in a way that, you know, there's there's all sorts of really engaging displays and opportunities to interact with 3D and digital displays that bring the product to life. So it's not just about the promotional side of it. There's very practical elements about maybe getting more immersive with products that you're thinking about buying. It's really great. It's a really, it's a, it's, it's a massive step forward for them. Mm. And I think a, a kind of example of, you know, how retail, how retail is going to change and become more experiential. You know, I remember like way back um, in the nineties when I was in the sports trade in the mid nineties, we used to call it retail theater, you know, and we probably did do a bit of that. Mm. And I think we lost a lot of that over mm. the last 15, 20 years. And I think now we're coming back to it. But I think there's lots of reasons why you'd still want to go in store. And of course, in certain product categories, you know, would you buy, I mean, the furniture brands and the, the homewares brands are doing a good job of enabling people to, you know, use AR to upload images of their, their flat and see what a suite, you know, what a, a sofa might look like in their, in their living room. But it's not quite the same as going and sitting on it, right? So I still think there are certain products that lend themselves to being bought or at least being experienced offline, although the transaction might end up being concluded online. Mm -hmm. But that's the world we live in. We live in a multi-channel world and some people will choose to start their journey in one channel and finish it in another. That's the thing. So also customers don't really see things as channels, right? Not at all. So, you know, you might go online to check out something first. You might be walking by and then pop into a store or vice versa. You have to be able to provide experience across all of those in a very different way, but yeah. something that has that unifying experience. Yeah. Let's talk about the metaverse. Mm. How how do you think that's going to shape how we buy things, the shopping environment? <clears throat> I, well, I think it's going to change everything. Mm. But like with all things technology, mm. I always say, and I borrow this line from someone else, but I always say that we we tend to over very much overestimate the impact of technology in the short term mm -hmm. and very much underestimate its impact in the long term. In other words, we think it's going to happen quicker mm -hmm. because it becomes very hyped up than it actually does to really get traction. Mm -hmm. You know, if you think about it, we've been talking about driverless vehicles for the last, you know, six years in a pretty big way. Mm -hmm. How many driverless vehicles are, are there on the road today in the UK? Best of my knowledge, I don't think there are any. And um, if there are, they have a they have a human being in them because I invested in a business called Cargo and they have a license to test um, driverless fulfillment vehicles, but they have to have a human being in them until at one point in time, presumably, you know, the government says, fine, these are safe and mm -hmm. you can put them on the road. So it's going to take a while. Um, but the metaverse, I think I understand it. You know, I mean, I've been trying to wrap my head around it and work out exactly what it is. But in my mind, it is a bit kind of Web 3.0. Mm -hmm. You know, Web 2.0 was however many years ago somebody came up with that buzzword to define where we were at on the journey with the web. Not really moved on from then. That's probably, good, must be the best part of 10 years ago now. Um, cause, cause it's a 2D experience. It's quite a flat experience. So for my mind, to my mind, this is web 3.0 and the metaverse is a, is a virtual world that we will interact with in a very meaningful way. Mm -hmm. And we will use cryptocurrencies to buy products. We will buy a combination of digital products. We'll probably also be able to buy um, physical versions of the digital products that we buy, although some of them we might not, like NFTs, mm -hmm. you know, unique individual pieces of art that only I have only one of in the world, but that's digital. I might also at some point in time be able to buy, you know, the physical version of that. Um, we will interact with people, we'll interact with our friends, we'll spend time in that environment. Beyond that, I don't know that I have got a vision yet for exactly, you know, what it will entail. I don't really know exactly how much of our time we'll spend in that environment because mm. I would imagine, you know, whilst, we, in fact, interestingly, this morning I saw on Twitter that the, the government of Barbados is the first government globally to set up a virtual embassy in the metaverse, right? Mm. Seriously, way ahead of the curve. I thought, what a great, what a great marketing initiative. <laughs> Those guys are really on it. Mm -hmm. You wouldn't expect Barbados to be the first ones in the world to do it, but there you go, fantastic. Fair play to them. <clears throat> um, what does that actually entail or what will that entail? I'm not really sure. But I think it will be a while, I think it'll be a good number of years before we are really immersing ourselves in it and spending you know, lots of time in that environment, gaming and, you know, whatever it happens to be. But I think alongside that, I think the physical 
experience. I'll go back to maybe I didn't should have answered this a bit earlier, but when you were asking me about the physical in, um, environment, I do believe that we will walk into retail environments and have a similar type of experience, whether it's through glasses or it probably will be. Google were probably just a bit early with their glasses when they came out initially, I don't know, eight, 10 years ago um, or six years ago, whenever it was. But I do think that we will walk into a physical environment and using augmented reality, virtual reality, there'll be a whole load of additional content and information and experiences that we will, will become a part of our experience, our mm -hmm. journey in that in that environment, whether it's a retailer, a restaurant, a car dealer. So it'll become much more immersive mm -hmm. and much more experiential. And I think that will happen at roughly at the same time that the metaverse really starts to get serious traction. So mm -hmm. that's my that's my top and swerve for what it's worth. And what do you think leaders should be thinking about in preparation to that of you know of of retail? You know, any 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 business that's actually selling something or selling a product. Well, I think the closer you get to your customers, mm. the better chance you've got of being ahead of the curve. Mm. And again, if your focus is on top of funnel and not end of funnel and not building lifetime value, mm. then arguably you're probably not going to be close enough to see the changes in consumer behavior. Mm -hmm. Right. So consumers will tell us, right? They'll tell us, I mean, technologists and other creative people will create the environment. Mm. The consumers will tell us when they're ready to embrace it, you know, because they will embrace it once it's once it's fit for purpose. Uh, and of course, there'll be early adopters and there'll be opinion formers who are involved already, who are buying NFTs, who are spending, you know, millions of dollars on one piece of digital art that they're never going to be able to hang on their wall. But it's the only it's a unique piece of art. Nobody else is going to own it. Mm. And these things, just like cryptocurrencies, are are increasing in value exponentially. It's mm. crazy. It's quite a hard thing to wrap your wrap your head around. But I, I wouldn't suggest that retailers, you know, charge ahead and start to do what Facebook have done and you know go and hire ten thousand people and call yourselves Meta. I mean, I was thinking about rebranding to Meta Martin, but somehow <laughs> it just doesn't. Somehow it doesn't work for me. Maybe I'm too old. I don't know. Um, so I'm not I'm not advocating that they charge head on first into this, but I think the closer you are to customers, the closer you stay to them, giving the customer a voice, you know, asking them what they're looking for, giving them ideas of maybe what you're thinking about your your part to play in that environment being. And you'll get a different answer from different types of customers. Because again, if it's an early, if it's someone like me who's an early adopter and is already spending a bit of time in that environment, then great. Chances are you're going to engage with that business because they're they're pursuing it. But then the, the it takes a while for the for the early majority and the late majority of consumers to catch up. Mm. Um, which is why, as I say, we tend to overestimate its impact in the short term and under, underestimate in the long term. Mm. The long term, it will be a complete game changer. For so sure. do you think it's going to completely, this is the new internet? Well, it's it's in my mind, it's Web 3.0. Mm -hmm. So it's not replacing the internet, mm -hmm. but it's taking it to that level. It's taking it to a place where, in my mind, all of a sudden, the internet can actually operate, this might sound a bit weird, operate on a par with physical. Because mm -hmm. often you hear the opposite. You say, oh, well, the internet's got an unfair advantage, right? Whether that's because of business rates or whatever it is, mm -hmm. to, some extent, to some extent it has had. But from an experience point of view and a customer experience point of view, until the internet becomes 3D and it really comes alive mm -hmm. and you can have a much deeper immersive experience, you're not going to see e-commerce sales going north of 30, 35%, mm -hmm. right, of total retail. Uh, if I'm saying to you today, it's somewhere between 26 and 28, and it'll probably end next year at 28. I mean, uh, obviously during the pandemic, it spiked, right? And it grew 50% during mm -hmm. the pandemic. Mm -hmm. Prior to the pandemic, it was 19% of total retail. Today, it's 26 to 28. It's mm -hmm. incredible. It's a 50% shift in, in 18 months. It's phenomenal. But it's not going to be 50% of retail sales anytime soon. I thought previously it might never be in my lifetime, but now with the advent of the metaverse mm -hmm. and where that's going, it could well do. Who knows? Um, but as I said, I think we live in a physical world. I think, mm -hmm. I, sorry, I think we live in a multi-channel world, rather physical world. We live in a multi-channel world, and we're we're innately social. We're we're innately social beings, and there's a lot to like about you know the endorphins get going when you buy in physical retail in a way that I don't think they do when you buy online. Don't know about you, but I don't I don't get a buzz at all. Mm. I love retail shopping. I do not get a buzz buying clothes or anything online. 
but I really do when I go into a physical environment because you get a much, you get that, you get that instantaneous gratification. Because first of all, you've got your hands in the product straight away, mm. right? So plus you can try it on, you can experience it, you can play around with it if it's digital or whatever it is. Mm. You can't do that online, but when you can do that online, then it becomes a leveler. I see as a customer, um, I see two different ways. Like, for example, if I go into a physical environment, for me, it's the interaction with whoever I'm, you know, whoever's selling really. It's like they tell a story or yeah. they say it looks good on you or exactly. whatever it is. Exactly. It's, for me, it's, the, it's less the immediacy of having the product, but more the experience or, you know, if I'm in a different country and, it, you know, that product's going to remind me of that time that I traveled somewhere. But on, I actually shop predominantly online. I, there's very, very few things that I even mm. want to step into a store for. And one of the things that's really enjoyable is you buy a product and there is that delay mm -hmm. because when it arrives through your box, you know, even Amazon, I mean, you're just constantly getting presents from somebody, sure. yourself, clearly buying those products for you. But there is that there is that element of having something arrive to you at a later stage that also feels very rewarding. I'm not, well, personally for me, it doesn't, but I mm -hmm. get, I get why it is for you and I get mm -hmm. why it is for different types of consumers. We're all, we're all, you know, we're not all cut from the same cloth, right? Mm -hmm. We're all motivated by different things, which mm -hmm. is why, you know, you have certain people who only shop online. You have certain people who only shop in stores mm -hmm. and then you have the bulk of people who, you know, switch between them. But I, mm -hmm. I, I agree. And I think the physical retail environment, being able to, and that's what I said, we're sociable human beings. Having that opportunity to engage yeah. with a store colleague and how it certainly used to be and how it should be and have that type of great experience where they can layer over an additional level of knowledge mm -hmm. or just tell you you look good in something. You know, I implemented mm -hmm. live chat mm -hmm. way back in 2007 at Ted Baker and I had no end of issues trying to get that one through past the board. You know, they're like, what? Why, why would... Why would anybody interact with live chat in a fashion brand? Mm -hmm. You know, I can understand with a technology product. And I said, sometimes you just want to know, is my bum going to look big in this? <laughs> <laughs> and even though, even though, you know, you can't, at that time, there wasn't video chat, it was just voice. Um, it was just typing. You couldn't see the person. It was just the reassurance. Mm -hmm. It's back to what the story I was telling about Wiggle. It's the reassurance that people need, mm -hmm. you know, that makes a difference. And you, of course, you get that when you go into the physical environment. Mm -hmm. Well, people buy from people. And what, going back to your point earlier yeah. about having, you know, having the team and taking care of first the internal before you even look at the external. Yep. And if your team is so in tune with a customer and has that two-way communication, mm. then you're going to feel valued, you're going to feel special. Exactly. I was talking so, about kind of the concept of luxury and was, somebody was asking me that and I was saying, actually, for me, it's the feeling of being taken care of. And if someone sends you a message saying, sorry, we're not actually, we're too busy to speak to you. And if you want to be responded to, you have to wait two weeks and please yeah. don't message us again. Yeah. I personally don't feel taken care of. No, of course so, not. And I think that probably yeah. is quite, you know, a feeling that majority sure. of the customers would feel. But you know, if you were, I agree with that. But you know, if you were asking, or if you were, if you were relaying that to, let's say, a room full of, you know, C, C level execs right now, some of them would say to you, "Ah, but that's luxury. You mm. can afford to do that in luxury." You know, mm -hmm. which again. I don't agree with you can do it in any business mm. you know one of the best businesses today in the united kingdom is ao.com they sell fridge freezers washing machines tumble dryers tvs you know it's not the sexiest a lot, a lot mm. of the products are not necessarily the sexiest product categories but this is a business that again understands end to end what it means to be customer centric it has mm. a great culture it brings people in that have the right attributes mm. who want to do better who want to do better for the business and for customers who are humble but also ambitious mm. But then if you look at how they measure the people who do the installations, if somebody was coming in here right now to install a fridge freezer in your kitchen, mm -hmm. they ultimately would be incentivized by one thing only, not how many fridge freezers or how many white goods do they install over the course of their working day, but how many customers mm -hmm. were fully satisfied. Mm -hmm. And that's what they're measured against. Mm -hmm. And so that drives the right behavior. What does that do? You love them. What do you do? You write to the CEO or you go online or you tell mm. other people, what a brilliant, what a, let me tell you about this great experience <laughs> I just yeah. had with this bridge freezer. Never thought I'd say it, you know, mm. and, and all of a sudden you're an advocate and you're, you're, you know, you've created word of mouth and you're telling other people about it and you end up, and that ends up, you end up becoming their 
marketing acquisition funnel, mm -hmm. you know, or drive or engine, because you're telling people about it. So mm -hmm. there's a cause and effect with all of this. I mean, you do it well, it doesn't matter what you sell. You can do it, it's cost effective because you're building lifetime value, mm -hmm. because people are going to come back. Mm -hmm. If they're not going to come back, what are you going to keep doing? Chucking a load of money in the top of the funnel. Mm -hmm. It's just going to fall out of a leaky bucket mm -hmm. because people don't want to come back time and again because you're not delivering that type of experience. Mm. Well, what I was talking about luxury and, and for me, the concept of luxury is evolving and changing. And I think the new concept is that. And I think it ties in very much with being taken care of as a customer. It almost doesn't matter what type of product, whether it's an expensive handbag or, uh, you know, something, a pair of shoes that mm -hmm. maybe is not as expensive or anything else that you might need from your home. Talking about what you're working on now, Martin, mm. like what's what's keeping you awake at night? <laughs> <laughs> what's keeping me awake? That's a great mm -hmm. question. My goodness. No, you're going to ask me that. Um, <laughs> Well, my puppy, uh, Lulu, who mm. is uh, near, well, is just turned one, actually. She occasionally keeps me awake at night and my wife. Same job. Uh, yeah, <laughs> apart from her. Mm -hmm. My daughters are growing up now, so they don't, although depending on what's going on, on, on in their life sometimes. Um, well, I mean, the main things, I'll tell you with the things that I'm, I'm working on, and there's not, I wouldn't say there's anything keeping me awake. There's lots of things that are keeping me very motivated. I suppose sometimes I do find it hard to switch off, and that keeps me awake at night. Mm. Uh, but for the right reasons. So I've got a kind of media bucket. Um, I've written a couple of books, the latest one, The Power of Customer Experience, um, which seems to be doing quite well. Um, I do keynotes, I moderate events, I chair events, I do roundtables, I write white papers, sometimes for vendors. Um, but then what, the thing that probably excites me more than anything that I've been doing recently is I created a mini MBA in customer centricity with the Oxford College of Leadership and management and the Oxford College of Marketing. And we have three cohorts a year in January, May and September. Uh, and, I'm, and, I, and I love doing that. And we get some great businesses on. Uh, I've got a whole bunch of people on from GlaxoSmithKline from their consumer healthcare business. We've got, I think, Shu and Hunkamoller and a bunch of other consumer brands coming on in January. And I just love that. I love it because... I feel like it's my opportunity to kind of give back a bit. And I also feel it's my opportunity to be that force for positive change, which is what I'm trying to do with everything that I do, because I feel like the more I can help people understand what that framework looks like and how you go about delivering the experience that customers are looking for and what that means in your business and how you do it, how you achieve it, how you transform, then I feel like I'm, I'm having an impact on that as well through mm. through these people that are going back into their businesses and and, and, and spreading, spreading the word, spreading the message. Outside of that, um, I do some board advisory work. I'm very privileged to be the non-exec chair of the Scouts, the retail arm, I should say, Scout store, not the full Scouts. That's too big a job for me. But the, the retail arm, which I really enjoy, um, which is a fast-growing business. Um, I'm also very privileged to chair an advisory board for a consumer goods business called the Mayborn Group. Uh, you may know Tommy Tippy, uh, uh, their infant product, their infant brand, uh, which does extremely well, category leader, and, and I think all, all the different products and variables that they have. Um, I also am involved with um, who I believe to be the certainly the clear leader in the buy now, pay later space globally, which is called in Australia and America, it's called Afterpay. And in the UK and Europe, it's called Clearpay. So it's two different brands, but part of the same business. Um, and what's interesting about them is they are basically transforming the way younger consumers want to pay. Because you may or may not know this, but, you, but my generation, you know, seven, roughly 65, 70% of my generation has a credit card. That level of penetration within millennials is about 25%. Within Gen Z is a fraction of that. So they're very much moving away from the traditional kind of consumer debt model. And buy now, pay later providers, in some cases, like Clearpay, enable consumers to get access to funds that they don't pay for, the brand mm -hmm. pays for it. So it's a really interesting model. So I do that. And then I'm also um, on, the, on the board of a brilliant charity called In Kind Direct. And In Kind Direct, what I like about them is it's, it's not it's probably not a charity you've heard of because we're not really consumer facing. But what we do is we take product from other businesses. So for example, Procter and Gamble will donate a hundred pallets of toilet roll. Unilever will donate you know, 20 pallets of personal hygiene products. And we make those products available to other charities to buy at a fraction, like 10 or 15% of the normal retail price mm -hmm. to give 
to the people in need that are using their charity. And so I really like the kind of multiplier effect of it because mm-hmm. I feel like I'm I'm helping thousands of charities, which in kind direct is, and millions of end users who who need that support. Prince of Wales is the patron, just in case you didn't know. Um, and then outside of that, I actually have my own customer service uh, website. So I have a website called customerserviceaction.com where consumers come every day, they tell us about the good and bad experiences they've had with brands. We share that with the brands. If it's a bad experience, we encourage them to do something about it. If it's a good experience, we also encourage them to do something about it so they can praise their colleagues or whoever it was, you know, that helped deliver that great experience for the customer. Um, And what I'm trying to do, I'm on a journey taking that core technology and trying to enable different brands, retailers mainly, to integrate that into their own website Mm -hmm. so it becomes like the front line of their customer service because customer service is kind of broken. You know, Mm -hmm. if I said to you or I asked 100 people, how would you contact the the top 10 businesses in the UK or top 10 consumer brands in the UK? How would you go about contacting them? Everybody, Everybody would probably say something different because some brands let you phone them, some don't. Some let you email them, some don't. Some it's a chatbot. Some it's a human being doing chat. Some it's none of the above, right? Mm. Some it's all the above. Mm-hmm. So it's quite fragmented. And and of course, as we know, all too often when we end up reaching someone in the contact centre, we don't always get the right answer mm. that we're looking for. So I think it's a I think it's a, a a part, a very important part of the journey that needs to be improved because if we're not going the extra mile to make sure that we resolve issues and that we give people end to end the experience they're looking for again, Mm -hmm. they're just not going to come back. Mm -hmm. But not only are they not going to come back, they're highly likely to go into social media or they're highly likely to tell their friends and family. Mm -hmm. Why would anybody want to do that? Why would anybody want to plow a big chunk of cash into bringing people in in the first place, but then allow these things to happen Mm -hmm. at the end of it? It's madness. Mm. You wouldn't do it, would you? Mm. You wouldn't do it if it was your business and I wouldn't do it if it was mine either. I think it's I think it's short term thinking and as you were saying, focusing on kind of cutting costs but not really seeing where the pitfalls of that are. Sure. Because, you know, with, with cutting costs, you're also cutting off opportunities yeah. and creative ways of actually solving problems. But when the costs are associated with <sighs> not communicating with the customer who's ultimately, you know, your buyer. You're only really focused on them buying the one thing, the one time, and hopefully not returning that, but never coming back again. Exactly. I'm going to be mildly controversial now. And it'd be interesting to hear your thoughts. But mm-hmm. I, I believe that we have to change the way our, particularly our CEOs and the people running our businesses are remunerated. Because if ultimately... We are asking people to to really focus on what happens in the next 12 months. Mm-hmm. And that's it. And that is the the, deter- the main determining factor for, you know, salary and bonus. Right? Okay, sure. Some people have long-term incentive plans, LTIPs. But, but you know, the bonuses are usually quite chunky, right? Mm-hmm. So if you're a CEO and you've got hundreds of thousands of pounds at stake, you know, are you going to make an investment decision on something mm-hmm. that you know might transform the business in two years' time, mm-hmm. but that might also risk your ability mm-hmm. to achieve your bottom line uh, EBITDA target for this year? No, you're not, right? So it's a, in my mind, it's a conflict of interest. So I think we have to find a different way. You know, we have to give CEOs, we have to empower them. Mm-hmm. We have to allow them to make these decisions and not penalize them. Mm -hmm. So we have to structure an incentive plan accordingly, you know, more, I think more, more fairly than it is at the moment. Mm -hmm. So I'm not saying it's the CEO's fault at all. If I was doing a job and somebody said to me, if you do your numbers this year, I'm going to pay you your salary of a couple of hundred thousand pounds or a few hundred thousand pounds. Oh, by the way, I'll more than double that, right? With a bonus. Mm -hmm. I don't think I'd be that inclined to make decisions that might risk that. Right. So my view on that, I think it's it's beyond the CEO. I think it goes back to who is hiring the CEO in the first exactly. place. Exactly, it's the shareholders, right? At the so, end of the day. do they and the expectations they have, not just of the CEO but of the business? I agree, hundred percent. So I should have I should have added that. I mean, I'm not I'm, I'm absolutely not having a go at CEOs at all. Mm-hmm. And, it, and more often than not, it's not the CEO who determines what that is. Mm-hmm. It is the shareholders, whoever that happens to be. You know, whether it's 
people who own a private business or whether it's the market mm -hmm. and investors. But, you know, ultimately there has to be, yes, you've got to, of course, you've got to do, you've got to perform well in the short term. You don't perform well in the short term. You might not have a business in the long term. Mm -hmm. I get that. Mm -hmm. But it's got to be balanced with having the ability to make decisions that really drive change and transformation mm -hmm. for the business to enable it to become the business that it could be. Mm -hmm. Whether that's around customer centricity, you know, whatever it ha whatever that driver has to be, whatever that North Star is, it has to be given the ability mm -hmm. to do that. And the people running the business have to be given the freedom, I think, to make those decisions. Otherwise, you know, you will only end up with a business that performs well in the short term and might not might may well not be here mm -hmm. in five years' time or four years' time. I think in life, we're always balancing the opposite ends of things. So whilst looking at the long term, we also have to consider what's happening in the here and now. Yeah. Because if you're focused so far in advance and you're not paying attention to what's going on sure. in the here and now, as you said, you might not even have a business. Yeah. But I think in terms of the CEOs coming in, I think there's there's, there's definitely longevity of, of the person staying within that. That's important because then they can actually do make decisions that may impact the, exactly. the short term exactly. now with a view for the future and i agree and i absolutely agree with that as well mm -hmm. and i think that you know one of the issues is that there is probably you know the tenure of a ceo today is is obviously a lot shorter than it used to be mm -hmm. and you know that that is something that has to be looked at but obviously that to some extent that comes back to how they're being measured mm -hmm. if you're measuring if the cause and effect is i'm measuring you only on what you do in the next two years mm -hmm. and um, but I'm really only going to incentivize you on an annual, you know, on a on a sort of twelve monthly basis. Then you're going to continue making decisions mm -hmm. that are really geared to the here and now, and that that therefore becomes a real risk to you and the business. And what happens in the short to medium term, mm -hmm. which is why I think one of the reasons why a lot of CEOs aren't blasting the course because they're not being they're not being set up for success in the first place no so i totally agree i totally agree i think a lot of it, i've honestly felt this for a long time this is for me is not a it's not a new phenomenon it's kind of been there for time and memorial on it but i but i think it has to change because otherwise you can't give businesses the opportunity to make the right decisions that ensure long-term not just survival, but the opportunity to thrive, mm. basically. Mm. And and it, and actually, when you think of it, and you go back to the cost to serve, it's a driver for that as well. Mm -hmm. Because again, if you're being targeted on a number and cost, and you know that by stripping costs out of the business, it's going to help you to do that number, achieve that number. What are you going to do? You're going to take costs out of the business. Mm -hmm. But arguably, that's going to be to the detriment of the business next year and the year after, mm -hmm. and the year after. Mm. Martin. Thank you so much for coming on to the show. My really pleasure. appreciate you coming here. What's the best way to reach out to you? Martin at martinnewman.co.uk <laughs> is my uh, my email address. Uh, my website, martin at martinnewman.co.uk. I've also got a sort of holding entity called thecustomerfirstgroup.com. Um, but those would be the main ways. Um, I can't remember whether my mobile is on the, on the website or not on the website, but um, certainly email martin at martinnewman.co.uk. And it's not a chatbot. It's not a chat, but you will get me. There's nobody else answering it. I don't even have a PA or an EA anymore. I used to have an assistant for years and it was just wonderful. And now I have to do all my own admin and everything else. That's what happens when you forego the, the niceties of having a, for, a, a bigger structure around you mm -hmm. that we were able to create with Practicology. But uh, no, I'm, I'm enjoying it and uh, being a bit more hands-on again. But uh, And of course, you can link in with me. You can follow me on Twitter, uh, any of the above. I'll add all of those in the show notes. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Martin. A pleasure Thanks for to having have you. Me. Thanks for having me, Maria. Thank Thanks you. a lot. Cheers. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for joining us here on Anatomy of a Leader. I hope our guest leadership journeys resonate with you and make you feel like you too can take on the world. Please subscribe so you can be alerted when new episodes are released. Comment, like, tell a friend, share on social media. I'll make sure to support you there as well. And let me know what inspired you, the changes that you've made, and how you too succeeded against all odds. You can find me on Instagram and LinkedIn with the handle MariaHVO, or just search for my very long surname. And if you're hiring leaders to take your business to the next level, reach out to me on LinkedIn. Again, that long surname. Thank you again for being here on Anatomy of a Leader. Bye for now.